Hi, friends. Max Elash here. On this episode of the Corpus Animus podcast, I have training think tank coach Kyle Ruth on, and we talk about heat, how it affects training, competing in the sport, and how to acclimate yourself if heat's a limiter for you. Train along some of the best athletes in the world at the sport of CrossFit. To get a free sample week of our current training cycle, head over to trainingthinktank.com slash DSGN. If you're on the go and you want to listen to just the audio version, subscribe to the Corpus Animus podcast on your favorite podcast app. Episode 35 of the Corpus Animus podcast was about breathing. Check that out if you haven't listened to it. We got a question specifically about that. We wanted to turn around and actually... Kyle did some research that I think could be helpful to expand upon the topic. I'll read the question. I'm interested in hearing about breathing slash working out in the heat slash sun in particular. My wife gets crushed when we do workouts in the sun. We had to be outside all summer, but somehow even when it's hot, but it's not in the sun, she's much better. She has darker hair, darker skin. That makes me wonder if it gives her problems. She had a heat exhaustion once doing a mountain meltdown event. So maybe that weakened, excuse me, weakened her too. Either way, I've racked my brain to try to figure it out and I don't possess the knowledge. Wasn't sure if this would be a fun topic for you guys to dive into or not. And if it comes up for others, I think it'd be fun. And I think it came up for others. So it's come up for us. Yeah. (laughs) Just in general. Yes. Exercising the heat is something you and I have talked about for the last, I don't know, probably four or five years. Yeah. It's just something that both of us, I think, struggle with or have struggled with. I've solved my problem. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah. I don't like the heat that much. I'm much. I'm a cold bear type person. As my temperature goes up, I don't want to work. It's funny. We just had this conversation recently. I hate the cold yeah. and I like the heat, but I, I've always disliked exercise in the heat. And I've, you know, interestingly, I've always found I only throw up from from workouts if I'm hot. Huh? It doesn't happen in in the cold. So that's an odd, I threw up for my first time ever in from a workout. One that I wrote. Yeah. Uh, Sorry. Stupid sled push workout. (laughs) My first day getting back, I was like, Oh, I want to get back into sprinting and sleds. I did like two sprints. It was like, Oh, I don't like this. In defense of the heat. It wasn't even hot that no, no, that was just out of shape. (laughs) That's just the acid of my out of shapeness coming out of my guts. I, I have a theory as to why I throw up when it's hot. All right. You ready for this? All right. So we know that water is a really good absorber Uh, of heat. I've heard this. Right. And so while I'm working out in the heat, I'm, you know, drinking water and beforehand I drank water. So I've got this like ball or bolus of water in my gut. And one of the easiest ways for your body to get rid of a bunch of heat is to superheat that water and then to get it out like that. Mm. So it's like sweating on steroids. So you're heating the water up and then purging it. Exactly. And you, have you ever noticed that, well, I guess you've only ever thrown up from exercise one yeah. time, but every time I've ever done it, as soon as I throw up when I'm hot, I feel better immediately. Mm. Do you think that's, that's right? kind of like puking anytime though? Like anytime yeah. you, like oh, if you're sick touche. and you puke, it's, it's almost like a, like a little high, like, yeah. dang, oh, it feels... I don't want to keep puking, but dang, that felt nice. <laughs> yeah. Should we rename this episode to puking? <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not. All right. So to address the question, I think we should go into a a couple of different topics. And when I went and did some research last, I'm not going to pretend. Are we going to go point by point through your notes of research? I think we should. I'm just going to make sure you cover all of them. (laughs) In depth from memory. Yes. (laughs) Look at this. No, I'm not going to pretend that these are things that I like knew before uh, I went and did some research. Like I've I know quite a bit about exercise in the heat, but this is a lot of stuff I learned just in the last day when we started talking about this topic. So um, the first thing is he said that it's his wife that's having the problem. And I think that really begs a really interesting question is why or what's the mechanism behind the fact that men and women tolerate exercising the heat vastly differently. And there's a lot of research that goes into the fact that there's a huge gender difference in uh, men and women's tolerance to exercise in the heat. And the first thing that I think is most interesting is the fact that uh, women in general are more susceptible to heat stress than men. And that's simply a, a function of body size. So men tend to have greater body surface area, which means that they have more of an ability to evaporate uh, heat or dissipate heat from their skin to the environment. So if you think about it, like a, a smaller female athlete is going to have less of ability to offload the heat that they're producing metabolically during exercise. Yeah, it's interesting that the two like primary heat exhaustion moments that people remember from the CrossFit games are two females, Annie 
Thor's daughter and Kara Webb both had, or Kara Saunders now, both had like pretty profound heat issues. I, I can't unsee uh, Kara Car running. R- running like that. It, I'll it never was, forget it either. And I think it's the other thing that, that kind of ties into that idea is that like, all right, so that was what, day three of the CrossFit Games, maybe day two of the CrossFit Games. So yeah, most of those athletes had been in California, had been in the heat for a, a handful of days prior to that. Um, why didn't you see that same issue crop up in the men that you did in the women? And as I was digging into the research, there's actually some, some really solid evidence that men, especially young men, yeah. uh, adapt to exercise in the heat much more quickly than women. So within five days, uh, a, a fit male will be acclimated for the most part to exercise in the heat where it takes a female about 10 days to reach the same level of acclimation. However, for females, After that 10 day point, they continue to improve their tolerance to exercise in the heat. And after that five day mark, there's no further improvement to tolerance for exercise in the heat for, for men. At least that's basically what the research has borne out, which makes sense. So all those guys show up, you know, all the guys and girls show up before the CrossFit games, like a week in advance. It makes sense that women are still in the process of adapting to the heat where men have been out there for five days. They're like ready to go and, and can, can deal with it. I think I read something back in the day. So I could recall this incorrectly, but there's something with testosterone receptors and sweat glands that higher testosterone generally leads to higher degrees of sweating in general. And so that could be one of the discrepancies between males and females in terms of adaptation quickly. Yeah. That's another one of the things that I picked up, um, going through the notes is just the fact that men do in general sweat more at the same metabolic, uh, heat production. So when you're exercising, your muscles are producing heat. We're we're actually incredibly inefficient machines, uh, at producing energy. So when we, you know, are splitting ATP and regenerating it, we actually create a ton of heat, uh, just it's the function of our metabolism. And a lot of that, it's called metabolic heat. And when at matched metabolic productions, men sweat way more than women. And I don't know, like I would assume the mechanism has something to do with testosterone or it's hormone related, but that fact as well allows men to offload more heat. Uh, might be burrito related. It could be burrito, but but what about offload a lot of heat when I eat burritos? Where do do you you offload it? And what kind of burritos are you eating? It must be a vegan burrito thing for, for, (laughs) why would I eat a vegan burrito? Why wouldn't you eat a vegan burrito? Should we get into that? We we should start a war. Chris is anti-vegan. Yeah. Everyone get Chris. I'm not anti-vegan. I'm just pro meat. (laughs) I'm just pro me not being a vegan. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh let's just put it this way. If I was vegan, you would have heard about it by now. Yeah, a probably. Lot. Yeah. Pretty much any decision you make. <laughs> <laughs> so, so looking at that, right? Men are better at, at offloading heat as a body surface area thing. They're better at sweating so we can get rid of the heat more. Now, all of that taken together, here's the interesting fact. Men are 2.6 times more likely to have a uh, heat stroke like a, a heat problem. Than, me, than women. Yeah, that seems strange. I, I'm i going to attribute that to our sensitivity and weakness. I feel like guys <laughs> get a common cold and we're like, oh, I'm dying. <laughs> and girls have to go through like a monthly sickness. So I feel like they just... <laughs> They're just more used to dealing with Or they're with just discomfort. smarter about getting out of the heat when it's <laughs> yeah, yeah. about like, to kill them. Oh, I'm hot. Like they're like, they're like, fuck it, I'm gonna keep training. And women are like, I'm gonna take shelter and get in the AC. So, so you when you start digging into the heat research, like our behaviors regarding heat are all centrally mediated, which means our brain is the thing that controls it. And yeah. one of our primary ways to deal with heat is to remove ourselves from the hot environment. So it may just simply be that men are not as in tune with yeah, their, uh, their feelings with I'm the, hot. the feeling of the emotion and, and cause it's all controlled by the same brain system. Those emotions and your sensation of, of heat are all controlled by the same brain centers. And, and essentially that's it. It's like when you get hot, it's like a, an emotion, get out of the heat. Yeah. And so you may men, you're bad at dealing with <laughs> yeah. exercise. And heat. I'm bad. At I'm, heat. I'm great at dealing with it. I get out of the heat. Okay, I'm, like, touche, I'm really hot. I'm going to slow down. Touche. You're great at dealing with exercise. <laughs> Just as heat. a performance athlete, maybe not. So I think, you know, it, that question was dealing with, you know, whether or not his wife was, you know, why is it his wife yeah. dealt with this and and he didn't? Well, that's one major potential factor is just the fact that yeah just something to think about yeah he could acclimate to the heat faster than she could you know he's he's going to offload heat better than she is just as a 
function of being male, although he is at a greater risk of having yeah. heat stroke than she is. But yeah, anyway, I think that's like the first part here. So the second thing that we should talk about is, is heat stress, right? So there's all these different terms that are thrown out here when it, when it comes to heat. So heat stress is simply defined as your core temperature at the end of exercise. So like if you start at, let's say 90, 97.5. Yeah. 97.5. And you finish exercise at, uh, 99 degrees, then your heat stress is 99 degrees. There's also like a, another term like heat index, which is like the amount that you actually increase the difference, so the difference between the two. But I don't think that matters that much. Essentially. I think what matters here is that there is a ceiling temperature for everybody. Everybody has like essentially a thermos, a central thermostat that your body basically is just going to cut off exercise. Yeah. And one of the, the good strategies that, that our brain has is it makes you pass out mm. so that you have to stop producing metabolic heat and you can't keep going. Yeah. At sleep is not always voluntary. Yeah, this would be involuntary <laughs> yeah. sleep as a protective, yeah, as a protective mechanism to keep you from killing yourself from exercising yourself to death in the heat. Now, if that happened in the middle of a desert and you stopped ex like, yeah, you, yeah. you might just die. Yeah. But that's an environmental yeah, factor yeah. that you can't really, we're control. talking about sports here where generally there's medical teams and stuff like that. Exactly. So one of the, the fascinating, this is just a, an interesting fact, but there are people who like most people tap out at about most well-trained athletes tap out at about 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Like that's the limit to their core body temperature. Yeah. It's like not measured on the skin, right? Like rectally measured core mm. body temperature. Who's doing the rectal measurements? It wasn't me. Are we going to start <laughs> doing them here? Uh, Evan? You're saying you're too good for rectal measurements? <laughs> I'm going to call up Evan and have Evan do <laughs> this. Doing rowing. Like, hey, come oh. on, man, get off the seat. I got to take your temperature. <laughs> hey, you said most people tap out at 104. Did you see any instances of like crazy anomalies? Yeah, they've had, they've actually measured some people getting up and sustaining 107 degrees Fahrenheit core body. I want to go, Ooh, forward. but I don't yeah. really know what that means. Yeah. Dude, well, I do know. So you had a fever. Recently. I had a fever with COVID three months ago and yeah. it got to like 103.9. I remember I looked it up and they say like, if you have a fever of over 105, you should go to the hospital. Cause like, that's where you start to get risk of brain damage and where like central systems start to fail. So this is the first time where I was like, oh shit, like I'm kind of worried. My fever ended up breaking that night. And I think that's the highest, my natural body temperature runs pretty low. I think like 96.8 to 97.5. If I just take my temperature on a regular basis is where I'll sit. And I felt really hot and uncomfortable at 103.5. I can't imagine that, like, maybe that is the same feeling I've gotten when working out, like doing a- I think it might be. Yeah. But it also feels like you almost feel sick at in some training sessions. Like if you just got that Wait. same feeling and you were like, all right, I'm going to take, take you completely out of this context and make you forget you were working out and you were just sitting on the couch and had the same feelings you had exercising where you're like covered in sweat. You'd be like, oh fuck, I'm so sick. I'm going to die. Yeah. That would we're be basically the... making ourselves sick in training. So I, I wonder the opposite of that. So you subject yourself to this heat stress constantly in training. And, and over time, one of the things that's going to adapt is your ability to tolerate greater and greater and greater core temperatures. Up they to, proved that? They said that you yes. can- um, yeah, yeah. yeah, for sure. So I, I would have to go back and look at the research. I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but untrained people, their like, temperature limit from exercise is much lower than well-trained athletes. And actually, we'll get into that a little bit when we talk about aging and heat tolerance. Yeah. But uh, I wonder if you can- train your body to tolerate a greater and greater and greater fever. So if you think about what's the function of a fever in the human body, it's basically to like cook the bacteria the or the virus, virus yeah. or whatever it is. Right. And so the higher a uh, fever temperature, your body and brain and, and organs can tolerate the more effective your immune system is at killing off pathogens. So I huh. wonder if having a really high tolerance to exercise in the heat is also an adaptive mechanism for having a, a more powerful, like a better system. survival strategy. Yeah. yeah. Like the human torch it, probably never gets sick. Exactly. Just <laughs> catches himself on fire and he's yeah. good to go. Now this is, he's externally combusting and we're talking about <laughs> internal combustion here. Oh, this good, is good very, point. very important. Yeah. But, this, uh, that, uh, concept in general is one of your notes here says exercise and heat results in elevated heart rate due to decreased venous return. So blood is shunted to the skin basically because the blood gets hot. It comes to the skin. Then you can evaporate and cool the blood off and cool the internal temperature right. as opposed to going back to the heart. And I think about this all the time with people who are obsessed with sauna and who look at the research where sauna improves aerobic activity 
aerobic output, not to the same degree as exercise, right. but to some degree. And I think this is the mechanism that's happening. So I actually looked into that w- before this podcast. What was the the literature on uh, a- adaptation and acclimation to exercise in the heat? And essentially the, <laughs> the gist, this was a 2000... 20 research review on acclimation to exercise in the heat and strategies for that. And essentially we don't have any idea. We do know that doing things like passive sauna exposure or exercising the heat for five to 14 days can improve your tolerance to exercise in the heat. But researchers as a whole don't really know why they have Mm. some, some guesses. And I I put some of that information in here. So like, obviously there's a psychological factor you're going to experience subjectively you're going to feel less hot when yeah. you're, when you're exercising more you, frequently yeah, than you've, you've been exposed to yeah. it. So there's, uh, you can never factor out the psychological <laughs> component, but then there's also an increase in blood volume. Right. And that is the one, if you were to say like gun to your head, Kyle, why are people adapting to exercise in the heat? I would say, I think it's an increase in blood volume. The more blood volume you have, the more you can push some blood to the skin and continue to supply the exercising muscles Mm. with what's necessary and keep that stroke volume higher. So people that are constantly using the sauna, one of the adaptations that they do know for sure happens is an increase in blood volume. And that increase in blood volume is going to make it so that during, uh, near maximal physical exercise, stroke volume is going to stay higher. Mm. And so people's heart rate isn't going to quite get as high. And so they can actually, potentially see an improvement in VO two max at, you know, near maximal outputs yeah. from, from sauna and heat exposure. Circling back you, or stepping back real quick. You said psychological component to it. I also think it's the same thing with like, I think of it like people who have tweaky backs with deadlifts, you tweak your back with the deadlift one time. And then that movement, every time that you go and do it, you have this traumatic experience memory that gives you anxiety that then almost makes you more likely to experience the same thing. Like the neuro tag idea where it's, it's like you see the, the heavy deadlift bar loaded and you immediately have the same back pain that you had. Yeah. And you remember that back pain. You remember what it did to you and it creates this like uh, reinforcing negative feedback loop. I think that same thing happens with heat. So you have one bad heat exposure, like, um, ties back into the question, ties back into the question. And then you go into that environment again. And you're not only are you hypersensitive because you realize if I push my limits in this environment, I can get too hot and I can go through that same thing before. And you're anxious ahead of time. That anxiety itself raises heart rate and all of the internal metabolic processes would start to heat you up. So it's like, Oh, there's a psychological component to just stepping into the same thing again. Not not only that, but that anxiety. So blood direction. So like shunting blood to the skin or to the internal organs, that is something that's controlled by the autonomic nervous system, right? And everyone knows the autonomic nervous system as the fight or flight system. Yeah. So if the fight or flight, uh, branch of that, the sympathetic side gets more active, then one of the things that's going to happen is you're actually going to shunt blood to the skin and to the muscles. So potentially you're like compounding the effects of heat on cardiac output. You're, you're going to, you know, send more blood to the skin, try to send more blood to the working muscles away from the brain and like potentially compound some of the heat stroke issues. So like that anxiety may make you more likely to be susceptible to that. So it's like a self-reinforcing pattern once you've experienced that and haven't dealt with, I mean, not that I would know how to deal with the trauma of having, uh, you know, a heat stroke episode, but you know, I mean, not having dealt with that. Yeah. I mean, I think it's how you go through any trauma. I mean, there's a a bunch of different ways, but I mean, even going to therapy about that type of thing to learn new mental strategies, to approach it, to keep yourself in a better headspace before you do it. It's the same thing with a traumatic sporting thing. Like you, your deadlift example. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or like an athlete missing a lift on a big stage in front of a million, you know, people. And then that experience for them is very traumatic. You know, they're, you know, chastised in media and people, you know, they're scared of doing it, trolled, scared of doing it again. And it creates these problems. It's going to be very hard for that athlete to step out into environment again 
and not remember that situation or be like, I don't want that to happen again. Whereas if somebody's athletic career was all these positive experience lined up when they're remembering, Oh, like there's a max snatch. I remember the last time this came up, I hit a PR in front of a million people and it felt great. And so like, there's a component of psychology, I think to every single thing. So it would be silly to think, Oh, we're just like this biological meat bag, but getting hot. It's like, well, your brain also has helped. <laughs> like, isn't that just called yeah. a hot dog? <laughs> yeah. We are basically hot dogs with arms. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily we're hot dogs with a brain yeah. that can have negative experiences that can make the hot dog get hotter. Could you imagine a two, 200 plus pound hot dog no. and the bun that would accompany that? Reminds me of this movie that my kids watched cloudy yeah. with a chance of meatballs. Yeah. It's just the most frightening thing to yeah, think. Yeah, a hot of, dog would be this wide. You'd never be able to get a bite of the bun <laughs> and the dog together. It'd be really depressing. Speaking of movies, I want to see the movie where Max has you pinned down, pulls out the strap and is like, tell me motherfucker, why are sodas making heat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's one volume. Yeah. It's Blood volume. I swear it's blood volume. Yeah, that's gonna be the thing. I'm gun, gonna let you go gun only to my head. if you give me the answer to this really random question that no one cares about except I, I think <laughs> I think it's blood volume. <laughs> but I don't know. I got kids. Man. Yeah. How, you have a sauna now. Have you noticed any differences? Yeah, the biggest the the biggest change that I've noticed from sauna is I'm now a totally elite athlete as a result. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. Um no. How I, long have you had it? Okay. What's I got, your use? I got it. What have you noticed? Okay. Uh, I got my sauna in late June or early July. I'm not entirely sure what the, the time this summer. Yeah. This summer. Um, I have used it nearly every single day since I got How it. How many months is that? Cause they don't know what. Okay. Know so yeah, it's December. So six months Perfect. I've used it nearly every single day since I got it. Um, you, I, what type of sauna is it? One it's with a the cold dry, dry heat sauna and I've got like the bucket and the yeah. ladle and all that. Mm, so I it, love that. Yeah. It's, I, I splurged on it for sure. <laughs> um, I, I've, like I said, I use it almost every, every single day. I started at 180 degrees for like 30 minutes. Actually, the first day I turned it up to max and I was like, I'm going to stay in for 30 minutes. Cause mm. and I was, it was impossible for yeah. me. It was probably possible, but I probably would have suffered some sort of yeah. heat stroke or, or heat exhaustion or something. Um, so I turned it down to 180 and started working my way up from like 10 minutes, you know, slowly up to 30 minutes. And then when I got to 30 minutes and I took it up to 185, I did that for a month and then took it up to 190. And now I just turn it up to max. I'm at 194. I can stay in for 30 minutes without any issue. Nice. Now I've started adding my cold tub to it and I'll go hot for like 20 to 30 minutes, go in the cold tub, go hot for another like 15 to 20 minutes and back and forth. So what have I noticed? The biggest thing that I've noticed is that it just doesn't feel hot in there anymore. Mm -hmm. That like at 194 degrees, if I leave it dry heat by the end of the 30 minutes, like, yes, I'm subjectively pretty hot, but like it doesn't feel hot on my skin. And I've like started to add some humidity to it. And now it's uh, again, a very stressful yeah. experience. Do so, you sweat the same yeah, I, I think I might sweat more than I did huh. when I first started. You but think that's one of the adaptations you get? Because I mean, for, I know it's sure. one of, there's a commonality in terms of very high performing endurance athletes being called prolific sweaters, which yeah. is a weird thing to be like, oh, you're really good at sweating, but it actually might be one of the most important things to keep your body cool in a it's, it's funny. Uh, since I've gotten my sauna, I've gotten a lot of people at training think tank commenting on how much I sweat now. They're like, oh my God, you look like Dude, you've been in the pool. we did a podcast and your armpits were drenched. <laughs> it's happening right now. <laughs> you just can't see yeah. it. I'm wearing three layers yeah. to make sure and five different deodorants, all right? Yeah. Well, it's all good. Yeah. So, but any like training adaptations? Yeah. So the, the biggest thing that I've noticed is like, even by the middle of August, I could go out for a run in Atlanta heat and humidity and I just felt comfortable. Like I was just fine going out at 1 PM and, and exercising and, or, you know, exercising in the garage or exercising in the middle of TTT yeah. doing 25 minute chippers. And like, I just felt fine. Like I didn't subjectively feel hot the way that I used to. Like I used to be in the middle of a Metcon and I would get hot to the point that I had to stop. Yeah. Like my, I'm like, man, my heart rate won't come down. And I think I was just, uh, I think honestly, I was just more comfortable with the sensations of being ridiculously hot for long periods of time while exercising. So you still get hot, but you're not feeling hot, hot, hot. <laughs> <laughs> is that a song? Yeah, that reference? is a song. <laughs> a little crab. Yeah. 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 No, I, uh, I, I think that's the big thing. It's like, I still, my body still responds to the heat by sweating and, and everything, but I don't subjectively feel as hot Got as it. I did. Now I know you're a family man and you have kids and a wife. 
But since getting the sauna, have you noticed any more eyeballs from the ladies? Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> you look like somebody that can get real I, hot. I go to two <laughs> places, my house and TTT. So <laughs> yeah. you can keep it, keep the temptation out of your life. Yeah. Yeah. So you have a note in here that my master's friends, I don't know if I, my master's friends would actually be enemies or frenemies. I don't think they like that. I talk about the decay of the biological <laughs> system. Well, here's another yeah, yeah. example of yeah. their decay. Yeah. It's not decay. It's just evolution, but the, heat tolerance is reduced in older athletes beginning about 40. Yeah. So why is maybe that's the whole like okay. hormonal regulation. There's thing, a or? bunch of different mechanisms here. And, and again, the researchers aren't entirely sure why this happens, but one of the things that they found is that blood volume is reduced. So as blood volume starts to reduce as you age, well, your Same tolerance concept. to exercise and the heat is going to be reduced. The other thing is, um, heat offloading is reduced. So sweat volume is reduced as you start to, to age. And again, this starts at about 40. It's not like all of a sudden you turn yeah. four. Like this would be the kind of piece of information that I would take. And I, I'd turn 40 and be like, oh, I can't I'm exercise fucked. the heat anymore. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm fucked. People, yeah. No, go ahead. Finish your thought and I'll come back. I was it. just going to say in general, don't take these types of information as like the gospel. Like you, that's the big, the big takeaway from this is the, the more you maintain your fitness, the higher your VO2 max, the more you train and the more you expose yourself to heat, the less this happens as you age. Yeah. This, uh, you said in here, maintaining high levels of fitness can delay or Im eliminate the reduction. When you said that the reduction specifically of your heat tolerance. Exactly. Okay. So you reducing your, your reduction. In yeah. Tolerance <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that's true with the people's psychology around aging. So like testosterone profiles, energy levels, whatever it is, they have this like, oh, I read research and this is happening and now I'm old. Like it just happens all of a sudden. But these are gradual processes with regards to the choices you make and the self-talk you have. And it's like, yeah, if you're thinking about an average 40 year old and you stop doing physical exercise when you're 20 and you do absolutely nothing and let that 20 years happen, there'll probably be a point where you realize like, oh my God, I'm so out of shape. Nothing feels good. I can't tolerate any of this. But if you're 20 and you maintain good lifestyle habits and you get to 40, that, that change, that marginal change will be so small and imperceptible with regards to your day-to-day -day activity that it'll be like kind of a gradual process of just aging gracefully. I think the bigger problem is thinking that there's these like, oh shit, I can't tolerate the heat now. Yeah. At 40, there's a cliff that I'm going to fall off and all of a sudden <laughs> yeah. I have to train in an air conditioned environment or yeah. I'm going to suffer heat stroke. Yeah. I, I think to that point as well, you know, speaking to some of the masters athletes that are listening to this, what that means is if you're going out to compete. Speak up so event, they can hear you. Yep. So if you're going out to it an event. A joke. Well, <laughs> hello. <laughs> Turn up their hearing aid. Wow. I just now got that. Man, that's really yeah, sad. That was, I didn't get it either. I thought he was just talking poorly. <laughs> no. So if you're going to go compete in an event that's hot, like Wadapalooza, and you live in someplace that's cold, like Canada, and you're a master's athlete, and it's in May, and it's still cold in Canada, and it's 95 degrees in Miami, then you should probably be seeking out some strategies to adapt yourself to the heat before you go down there. Or else as a 45 year old, your risk for as a 45 year old female, your risk for, uh, you know, heat issues in Miami is pretty high. Yeah. So that's what it should inform. Uh, hold on. That does bring up a pretty interesting thing at CrossFit. You know, they're always testing for the different, you know, what we what can, can we throw at you of fitness, right? And, uh, something that's never really happened is training in the cold. Oh yeah. Like, I, I mean, and think about all the Iceland people and like, I know uh, Ohio is a big fitness area too. And that's yeah. pretty cold. And like, yeah, they've never done that. I, <clears throat> first of all, I would love that personally. Second of all, I feel like that is more likely to happen in the future. If they're going to try to take the concept of the CrossFit games being something like world strong man that travels around to different areas and does it. And I do think that would pose a very, very, very interesting thing. Yeah. It's much harder to be strong in the cold because your joints and all that stuff aren't. Yeah. Well, although you part, say that all the strongest people are in Ohio. Right? Yeah, 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 true. <laughs> That's or because I, they have nothing I else said, to do. Well, also they have heated gyms where it's a bunch of people. In I don't know. Clothes. No, no his two gym examples, wasn't hot. It think, wasn't. Think no, about this. Hell no. His two examples, Ohio and Iceland, where the strongest people in the world are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Wow. laughs> Those are excellent well, examples of where really strong people are though. Yeah, it is. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's the, the just but for weak side. bitches like us. We're gonna be like, yeah, oh, my joints. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I need yeah. I need to be warmer. Yeah. No, and, I just I just coach and someone, breathing in the cold. I just coached someone at Legends, and their biggest complaint was that it was cold. Yeah. When I went to Northern Ireland the first time at CrossFit eighty twenty, which now has a different facility, they were in a um in a very industrial building that was old, so it didn't have like up to date heating standards and stuff. It was the coldest place I'd ever been to train, like legitimately under freezing cold. So uh, many of the athletes that competed at Filthy 150 complained about dealing with the environmental conditions at Filthy 150. And Cedric LaPointe, who's from Canada, was warming up in a cutoff (laughs) (laughs) t-shirt. Yeah. Just to show that like acclimation, temperature acclimation works both directions. Yeah. But it would be interesting. Like we're talking about heat. If the whole, the whole issue people were dealing with is like, oh, I can't breathe really well in the cold because oh, it probably to, would happen. You need to yeah. nose breathe. And that's then. a part of the fitness definition, right? Yeah. <laughs> Broad time, modal yeah. domain, Dave and Castro, temperature. You create a training gym that is a giant refrigerator for next year's games. No, a temperature controlled <laughs> training facility that can be swung from Holy hot crap. to cold. That, <laughs> yes. Event event one. Mid event. Dude. Event one Murph <laughs> at a hundred and a hundred and four degrees. Yeah, we're gonna you want chaos yeah. and random. Yeah. We're gonna start at one oh four and get you really sweaty and then halfway through <laughs> oh, no, you we're so gonna mean. drop it down to thirty two degrees. Then we're gonna see. hit the strobe light. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna see who gets hypothermia. See the potential <laughs> risks. Yeah. Hypothermia, yeah. hyperthermia. And seizures. Yeah. This is how the CrossFit games turns into the hunger games. <laughs> <laughs> We're working. <man>. Yeah. <laughs> That's what TTT's ultimate competition will end up being. People will come in and be like, all right, you guys are going to run towards me and you're going to do burpees and I'm going to shoot you with paintballs. <laughs> Why? Oh, God. Like, I just wanted- it sounds like Max's dream <laughs> yeah. TTT camp. Jeez. Like he gets a paintball gun in a tower and everybody else has yeah. to do a few. Who can get out. to me with that? First time hit. I ever played paintball, they were like, I was like, nine and they were like it doesn't hurt it hurts enough so you don't want to get hit again but you're not going to cry first time i got hit in the neck in the throat <laughs> and i was like fuck you guys this really sucks. <laughs> i want to cry for sure <laughs> in the neck <laughs> all right um well let's let's look yeah. at it like this we've i think we've addressed some of the mechanisms that would but you know for, from his question like why would this happen well that explains why but what i like to do is kind of finish things with like how can you potentially deal with this in the future? So some actionables. Yeah. First off, if you're a male, you should acclimate yourself for between five to 10 days. If you're a female, expect your heat tolerance to peak at about 10 days. So keep that in mind that it may take you a longer, more graded exposure to exercise in the heat to be able to deal with it. Uh, secondly, hold on, on that note, yeah, if well, I'm traveling somewhere that I know it's going to be hot and I'm used to cold and you say five days for males, if I can't get there early and, and actually acclimate, um, is doing a sauna like a good second best? That's or, where uh, I was going next. So uh, strategies for heat acclimation. First off, there's passive heat acclimation, which would be like using a sauna. Uh, three days per week for two weeks has been shown to be enough to heat acclimate you. And keep in mind that that needs to be either a dry or humid heat sauna. I don't know if there's any research on the you know the infrared saunas or anything like that for a heat acclimation. The infrared saunas it. are not also not as hot. They're not, but they also are heating you through a different mechanism, yeah. which we could touch on in a second as well, which I think yeah. is applied to her question or to his question. Um, but so sauna three days a week it needs to be hot enough. It needs to be like at least about 180 degrees. You need to be in there for like 20, 25 minutes. So it's got to be pretty uncomfortable yeah. for you. Um, that would be one, one strategy. Another would just be to turn the thermostat up and get on the assault bike and start doing some, some intervals because training the, it, the other thing is that research is very clear that training in a hot environment is more effective than passive yeah. exposure. What about a sauna suit? So we used to use those for yeah. cutting weight and wrestling and they, they create an enormous amount of heat. And because it's, it doesn't allow any dispersion, the sweat kind of just sits and pools in there and you get really hot. I'm not sure that's necessarily safe. I've never seen any research on it, but I know we used to use them for weight cutting and I know it makes training in a hot wrestling room with other <laughs> hot men fuck really, really, really hot. <laughs> so I hey, don't you, know. you slipped in a fuck at the wrong <laughs> point, my friend. Hot <laughs> men fuck. fuck. Uh, yeah. I didn't yeah. mean it like that. That's gonna be the intro. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, I don't know enough about the sauna suits to to like safely give an answer to that. So I would say I would 
advise against that. Okay. <laughs> Don't do that. My professional but, opinion yeah, is yeah. I advise yeah. against that, but for, let me do yeah, more research. For legal liability. <laughs> yeah. Um, some of the other things like there's pre-cooling. So for example, cyclists use this. They can dip in an ice bath before an event in, in the heat. So basically their goal is to lower their core temperature. One of the things we talked about was like heat index or the change yeah. in, in temperature from beginning of an event to the end of an event, right? So if you start at 97 and you go up to 90, well, we'll say you go up to 104, like yeah. you're a really well-trained athlete in the heat. Well, now let's say we start you at 96 and you go up to 104. That's just a little bit longer that your body can sustain higher cardiac outputs. Yeah. So there's a potential performance improvement. And I've done that. I've done pre-cooling using a vest. I've done pre-cooling using ice bags on my forearms. And it does, it does make a difference subjectively in exercise. So if, you know, in, re, with relation to this question, if his wife and him have to exercise outside, she should spend some time pre-cooling before she goes out. Yeah. One of the other strategies is uh, using ice slushies. So literally taking a Gatorade or whatever, you know, if you're anti-sugar yeah. or whatever it might be, take that, put it in a blender, blend that sucker up, and then just basically make like an ice slushy and drink that and drink the ice. Don't just drink the liquid from it, but drink the ice. Yeah. That's been shown to help keep core, core body temperature lower. And again, will help people deal with exercise in the heat. But um, I think your best strategy is acclimation. You know, the way that we acclimated this past year was, was really abrupt, but worked really well. I convinced everybody at training think tank to do Murph at 1 PM. <laughs> not a good, that <laughs> on, was not on an Memorial acclimation. Day. That was like a one-time death exposure. Were you hot after that ever again? No, not really. Me neither. Yeah. I also didn't do Murph again in <laughs> midday. So <laughs> it could have been that like, I'm not doing this. No, again. no, 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 no. It yeah. worked. Right. It worked perfectly. We're going to do it again next year. <laughs> Uh, so those I think are, are some of the big ones that you can do. There's also like hyperhydration stuff. You can, uh, menthol, um, can, can create the sensation of cooling and, yeah. and different things. But I think your best strategy is make sure that you're acclimated to the heat. If you know, you're going to have to be training outdoors and you know, when the heat's coming, then go start getting in a sauna. That's yeah. the best thing she could potentially do. Now, I, I don't know with a history of heat illness, obviously that's something that you would need to speak with your doctor about. Beforehand. Yeah. So that's all the biological stuff. And then the psychological stuff is figuring out how to have better self dialogue. How much are you telling yourself? I'm not good in the heat. It's like the same. It's like the self fulfilling prophecy with a skill. I'm not good at double unders. If you keep saying you're not good at double unders, you're going to never be good at double unders. You have to figure out like, words to describe self-belief and self-confidence. And some of that is through the action that you take to change your biology in a positive direction. And some of it I think is figuring out cognitive behavioral strategies, talking to therapists, reading books on how people deal with it. Like how bad do you want it? Or I remember I read Chris McCormick, who is a triathlete, right? world-class triathlete from back in the day who was very, very, very successful, but couldn't cap it out in winning Kona. And he talks about the, and that that's super relevant to right now because Kona is, uh, the Ironman world championship that happens in Hawaii in the blistering sun. And one of the primary things is heat. Like he talks about the, the burns and blisters he would get on his forearm because you're sitting there riding in midday sun and it would like literally burn and bubble up his skin. So like, they're basically <laughs> like taking wet rags and cooling their skin. So it's a it's an interesting concept and shows what an elite athlete is willing to go through to figure out how to acclimate better. So obviously you're not being, you know, she's not being paid to be a professional athlete in the heat, but you take that down and let's say that guy was at a hundred percent scale that down and do like 10 to 20% of what he did to build his self-belief. And maybe you move yourself forward in a positive direction. For sure. I think we answered pretty much all of the components of that question. Anything, any questions that you might have for, yeah, I don't know. I got nothing. I Chris. have one. Did yeah. you find anything about, <clears throat> so I always hear, you know, you can correlate leg strength with like health, overall health. Have you yeah, heard that? Yeah. Is like, there anything like that with heat tolerance? Like are people who are more, did you see anything like that? Yeah. That would be interesting though. Cause you brought up the point of being able to just like deal with higher fevers before they kill you. Yeah. I don't, that was a, an yeah, idea. Yeah. Not, 
Uh, yeah, not a scientifically backed concept. Chris, no, I, I didn't read anything about that, but I also wasn't looking for that specifically. Sure. I was looking specifically for exercise tolerance yeah. and, and the heat, but that might be a really interesting route yeah. to go I mean, down. that there's a huge movement and it's hard for me to differentiate cherry picking research to support your beliefs and what your business architecture does. But like, if you think of the, so what I just did, <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> yeah. yeah, like the, um, who's the scientist who's on Joe Rogan all the time that promotes saunas, Rhonda Patrick, uh, Rhonda Rhonda Patrick. I'd probably reach out to her and get her on here. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be curious to hear about that. And then the, uh, Laird Hamilton, I feel like is the surfer who does some crazy shit if, in the sauna. If you're listening to this podcast and you haven't seen his sauna protocols, like wearing oven mitts, riding the assault bike in a sauna that's at 220 degrees Fahrenheit, which my sauna won't even go up to. Yeah. Um, you should take a look yeah. at that. So it's, it's like a whole level. Yeah, of yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully he's right. <laughs> he's, not, he's just frying his internal yeah. system. He's literally cooking yeah. his brain. Like proteins start to denature at a certain temperature. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. At some point he's got to be just like cooking himself from the inside out. Mm. Or maybe he's turning himself into Superman. So basically you haven't found anything to answer his question. Sorry, Chris. I don't have no, an answer to that one. Uh, and then anything about cold? Uh, cold. Should we just do a whole nother cold <laughs> yeah, episode? Yeah, let's do a cold Yeah, we'd episode. have to do some research on cold, I feel like. I play with cold stuff all the time. I hate the cold, yeah. but I did build a cold tub. Yeah. I'm, I'm going I'm to post my cold tub plans in the classroom. Yeah, that's that way, right. if anyone else wants to wants to build one and experiment with it, they can. <laughs> anyone else wants to do my potentially <laughs> stupid project? <laughs> it was fun, man. It was like building Legos as an adult. It was awesome. Legos right. are so satisfying. Don't try to end this. Damn it! I'm sorry. <laughs> there was just like a an abrupt silence, and I was like, "This is usually when we end." Yeah. No. Let's 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 just wait it out. Just be a little awkward. Yeah. All right. Hey. Hey. I, I sweat real. Did you know, there's I sweat actually, real easy, Kyle. Does that mean I'm elite? You're definitely elite. Did you know there's three three different kinds of uh, humid or hot environments that people have to deal with? No. Yeah. So here's a, a fascinating one. Uh, humans have different responses to different types of environments. So a dry and hot environment, you can actually tolerate greater uh, ambient temperature so that the air temperature can be higher and you can tolerate it. But if it's humid and hot, because you can't offload as much heat to the environment through sweating... Oh yeah. That's why I always get mad at my family. Who's like, you know, in Texas, they got that dry heat in certain spots. And then I'm like in Memphis baking. It's like, no, shut up. Yeah, yeah, not, my hot's worse than your hot. Yeah. yeah. I, I can attest to that personally. Like the temperature in Arizona when I was living there was, was way hotter than Southern Florida or Atlanta in the summer. And at nighttime, it'd be like 105 degrees and the pavement would be radiating heat from the day but I could exercise in that way more effectively than 99 or 90 degrees with hundred percent humidity in Florida. All right. So you talked about the pavement radiating heat. And so in the initial question, he said his wife has dark hair and darker skin. And we do know that darker colors absorb more heat from the sun, more radiant heat from the sun. And that might be one of the potential mechanisms why she is particularly susceptible to heat issues and he mm. may not be, but it also might not be. Yeah. There you go. That's Thank the you. Capstone, Chris. Thank you. Octopus teacher. <laughs> that was a good show. <laughs> it was. I'm glad, I'm glad you liked it. Did you ever finish it? No. Good. I want to, I don't want you to be part of the octopus teacher train. How anyway. long do they live? Yeah, Chris, I'm not blowing the, well, I guess that wouldn't really blow. I think there's like uh, three years, three years, same, yeah. same amount of time as a rat. You know what I was thinking? So I got finally got turned on to the Mandalorian. I, I was anti, I'm not going to watch anything Star Wars for a while because uh, they ruined you, it. You broke it. But then I was like, everyone kept, they got a second season and then people said, it's no dude, it's still good. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I'll try. And it, it kind of has revived my, okay, well, someone's doing Star Wars right somewhere, but baby Yoda, well, he's not actually Yoda, but that baby wannabe yeah. Yoda, he's 50 in the show. And that got me thinking, I was like, man, you said an octopus lives, lives three years. It's like, why couldn't my dog have, if baby Yoda could be a baby at 50, why couldn't my oh. dog be like a baby dog for a year and then a medium sized dog for a year. <laughs> and then he goes to just looking normal. Yeah. Dogs just happen too quick. Yeah. We need that cute factor for a little longer. Yeah, the you know cute what I'm factor, but not the pissing shitting factor. Sure. Is, are you over that stage? No, I no? am cleaning up pee and poop. 
Oh, you oh, know, I wish oh, they it, had that in the Mandalorian. Uh, Baby Yoda just like shitting and pissing yeah. everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, fuck, come on, dude. Yeah, no. Remember how I invited you to bring your dog? Yeah, not no, yet. I mean, <laughs> right, I'll let you know when she's good to go. Wait, wait which one's a cricket? Which one's Don't a do cricket? It. <laughs> yes. I wouldn't have hit that one. Okay. Kyle, well done on your research. Thanks for being here. Octopus teacher, well done as always. Chris, you did all right. Thanks, Chris. Peace.